Hello there. Uh, this is Natasha Sachdev for The Quint, and I'm here with Prashant Bhushan, sir, who is obviously one of the most well-known lawyers in India and an eminent activist uh, when it comes to the corruption space. Um, Mr. Bhushan is uh, well known to everyone, obviously, as is his father, Shanti Bhushan, former law minister, who crucially wa was the man who fought against uh, Indira Gandhi in a massive election case way back in the 70s, which unfortunately ended up precipitating the emergency, but was crucial for showing that we can stand up for our rights and that our courts and our constitution can help us do that. And that is in fact the subject of this book, The Case That Shook India, written by Mr. Bhushan back in the 70s and republished recently by Penguin. Um, Mr. Bhushan, uh, obviously at the time when you wrote the book, it was, it was new, it was important, it was uh, you know, big events going on at that time. So uh, what were your motivations behind, uh, did, did you have anything specific behind why you wanted to write this book at the time and why you, want, why you felt that it was important? No, uh, I just happened to have an inside view of the court proceedings. <laughs> essentially because my father was the counsel for Raj Narayan in this case. And uh, uh, I felt that it was an important case, both from the point of view of legal and constitutional history of this country, as well as uh, because of its political ramifications. And therefore, uh, I felt that uh, I might as well write about it. Of course, the initial draft of the book was written in early 76, right. uh, soon after the case ended in the Supreme Court in right. uh, November 75, yeah. uh, but it, got, it could get published only after the emergency well, ended uh, uh, in 77. Sure. So for those who, uh, who aren't aware at the time, before the emergency, um, there was an attempt by Raj Narayan, who was Indira Gandhi's opponent in the Raibareli constituency to unseat her from her and to cause her to be disqualified from her election in the 1970 general elections uh, for corrupt practices. And this was an incredibly controversial case. It involved looking at things like uh, expenses being used in, and utilizing uh, government officials for by the prime minister to try and get herself elected. Um, now, Mr. Bhushan, obviously this was back in, the book was originally published in in, as you said, 78, 77, actually. And uh, it's been a long time, obviously, since then. So why republish it at this time? Uh, it's been out of print for more than 35 years. And during this time, especially in the last uh, several years, several people have been asking me for copies of the book, mostly uh, law students and uh, lawyers. And a lot of people since I didn't have any copies to give them, I could only get photocopies made. Right. So there were uh, many people asked me, why don't you get it uh, republished? Mm -hmm. And uh, recently, when one of my junior colleagues, Siddharth Garg, said that uh, he would uh, undertake the responsibility of getting it republished, and he approached Penguin, and they eagerly uh, accepted, then we decided to have it republished because uh, there is uh, still a lot of continuing interest in this case for obvious reasons. So um, I've actually been doing a, a book review of, of this book for The Quint and uh, I have to say it's, it's an incredibly interesting uh, piece for a number of reasons because as a lawyer I have read the, the Supreme Court judgment, we've studied it in, in class, but what we don't go into is the sort of details which for instance the High Court decision went into, which was where Ms. Gandhi was, Mrs. Gandhi was actually disqualified and then had to you know, be saved by the Supreme Court in a, se in, in a sense. Um, and I found it with these little details which, make it, which made it quite, fa quite so fascinating. Um, we recently in the, at the Quint were talking about also how the fact that court proceedings, there's no transcript, there's no transparency, all you get is a final judgment, you don't get to see the actual arguments before the court. Uh, and this obviously is incredible because you were there in the courtroom at the time when this was happening. So, how you know how was your experience of trying to sort of keep keep this, these running notes of what was happening? And uh, did you feel that this was a job which uh, which was very difficult to do, or do you think the journalists need to do this better, or do you think there's a need for reform at this point in the courts? 
Well, I have always felt that uh, there need to be video recordings of court proceedings, which today is very easy given the kind mm -hmm. of technology that we have, yeah. which will give us an accurate record of all court proceedings. Um, uh, most journalists don't record uh, questions from judges, answers by counsel, etc., because it's not so important and there isn't that much interest in so much detail about the case. But this was one case because of its uh, uh, constitutional importance as well as political importance where I felt that there would be that kind of interest. It's not difficult to keep these notes. Some of these good court reporters do maintain such notes of questions and answers from judges. They don't write uh, about it in such detail because uh, the newspapers don't have that much space because papers feel that there isn't that much interest in so mm. much detail. Uh, but it's not difficult to uh, keep notes, though it would be much better for there to be video records. Yes. Because, for instance, uh, one of the really interesting things is in the appendices you've added the testimony of Mrs. Gandhi, uh, which I thought was absolutely fascinating to, to, to go through because again we don't get this you only see the excerpts will come in in the in the judgment and um, so in terms of uh, how, to, how to try and make this whole process more transparent give the public more especially where the government is involved is in, in a case like this we recently saw with the Aadhaar judgment um, there were some lawyers in the court who were trying to live tweet what was going on do you are you do you approve of this kind of, of thing where lawyers are being able to tweet from inside the courtroom what arguments are being raised and what's being done? I don't see anything uh, wrong with that. I don't see any harm so long as it is done accurately. Right. Uh, and therefore, uh, people should be accurate in what they do. Of course, I must say that in this case, uh, while the case was going on in the Allahabad High Court, there were some good court reporters in Allahabad Right. who were reporting the arguments in great detail, the questions mm -hmm. and answers, etc. But when it came to the Supreme Court, the emergency was, was in force and press censorship was there and therefore the arguments were not being reported by any newspaper. So probably my notes were the only record right. of the arguments in that case. Actually, I had also maintained similar notes of that one and a half day aborted review of case one and the Bharat right. which is which there is in, in the, the appendix, case. yeah, uh, as well as the habeas corpus case, right. the ADM, ADM Jabalpur case. But unfortunately, I uh, am now I recently I tried to uh, dig out those notes and yeah. I can't locate them. It's That's a great pity. Huh? That would have been that would have been quite fascinating. Um, to just sort of go back to the case and what and, and what it means uh, today, because nowadays everyone seems to just think it's normal for people, for politicians to be spending crazy amounts of money, corruption, everyone is, it's, I mean, we don't like it, but it's, you know, nobody seems to think that there's a way to to deal with it. What, so when, when your father took up the case at that time, like, I know you, you made some comments about this in the book as well, about what he was hoping to achieve out of it. But, I mean, how, how, is, how do you think lawyers today should try to approach a case of this, where, say, they know that they may be, find it difficult to win, but they think it's important to take up? How, do you think lawyers should be trying to take these kind of activist stances and trying to make, 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 make some sort of a change in these circumstances? Or do well, you of course, uh, I, since I do mostly public interest litigation, my own view has always been that lawyers need to be conscious of what is happening in society and need to be activists of some kind. Uh, but unfortunately, very few lawyers yeah. uh, even look at the kind of cases that they take up or whether there is justice uh, on the side of their clients. and. Many lawyers don't even follow ethical practices while uh, handling cases. So Election petitions actually are <laughs> one class of petitions which are rarely decided before they become infructuous because within five years fresh elections are to be held. Yeah. And very few, though the law says, constitution says, the uh, representation of people's act says that election petitions should be decided within six months 
but uh, hardly any election petition is ever decided in six months and very few election petitions are decided within five years right. with the result that most of them have become infructuous and that is why transgressions of election law corrupt practices etc are not taken seriously because most people feel that they will not be held accountable because the cases filed by their opponents are not going to be decided in time even mrs gandhi's case right. initially went quite slowly it's only after justice sinha took over as the judge handling the case that he speeded it up and brought brought it yeah. to a conclusion within 6 months of having taken it up yeah. that was in 74 and he took it he took some time towards yeah. the end of 74 so uh, even that case took uh, almost 4 years right <coughs> for it to be decided so normally election petitions are to be decided within 6 months it would yeah. be would be the hope um i think uh, one of the important things is you know when it comes to a lot of these things about the law a case like this or trying to understand legislation like this it's it's quite difficult for often for lay people people who don't have uh, an understanding or study of the law to to understand this one of the things which i which i found very very uh, incredible about the book was how easy it was how you tried to break down very complex and technical arguments into an easier process and i for someone who's trying to do more of this kind of writing in the space i uh, it's it's something i struggle with so how is it that you as in was do you have any pointers about how lawyers can try and help make things easier for you know trying explaining complex things and in, in, in which are important for people to know to the general public so uh, <clears throat> law is meant for the people uh, the constitution and the law are all meant for the people and there is no point in having a constitution and law which people can't understand uh, unfortunately you see there is a tendency amongst some lawyers and some judges to unnecessarily uh, clothe everything that they are saying in legalese use latin phrases and so on and so forth and thereby obfuscate what they are saying for the common people when i wrote this book i was uh, an undergraduate student right uh, and uh, therefore i i had not studied law when i was uh, writing this book um, and therefore i was looking at it from a layman's point of view and of course uh, there was a lot of law in my family my right. father grandfather etc were all lawyers uh, so uh, i mean i could perhaps understand a little more law than many other lay people could right. but still my own effort uh, in writing has always been to write in as simple uh, a language and try and uh, put across things in a manner which ordinary lay people can understand which is how things should be right because uh, i mean we look at um, and that's an incredible observation because i some of the arguments as i mentioned are so technical so for someone so do you think that you know if the that journalists if they work it can actually try and make this easier for lay, for people who not who are not actually lawyers to understand these kind of things because the arguments were incredibly difficult and yet you despite not being a lawyer at the time you were able to to frame them very easily did was that something where your father helped you with, with that or or were you able to just no, my father did not even read the book until after it was written okay and in fact he perhaps read only one chapter before it was published right <coughs> um no see there are Uh, there are some uh, good court journalists who do write in a manner which ordinary people can understand because they are writing for newspapers they are not writing for legal journals etc right. so the good court journalists writing for newspapers do write in a manner which ordinary lay people can understand and any any uh, any reasonably intelligent person can do that it's not so difficult So one of the things which you mentioned in the preface to the book uh is the fact that there have been now new changes under the Finance Act 2017 which are making it um more difficult for 
to actually get any information about the fund being given to political parties. There is no longer a limit on the amount of money a, co a company can donate to a political party. Polit you can now buy electoral bonds which are anonymous. Um, when you're looking at the state of the corruption in politics now, and when you're looking at it versus then, uh, how do you think these kind of challenges can now be tackled? Because even the legacy of that case was where the government was making retrospective amendments that right and center to make their old illegal acts legal. How do we try to combat this uh, today in the courts, something like, for instance, the, the changes in the Finance Act? And is, there, is there a possibility to actually contest these things and, and, and try and hold our, our political parties and organizations more accountable? See, unfortunately, uh, elections today in this country are won or lost to a very large extent on the basis of the amount of money that the candidates have access to. Because people, when they vote, they vote not merely for the candidate whom they consider best. They also vote on the basis of which candidates they see as having a winning chance. So they, nobody wants to waste his vote and vote for an excellent candidate who has no chance of winning. Yeah. And this, uh, being able to see who are the candidates who have a winning chance, is largely a function of the visibility of those candidates. And visibility is normally purchased by money, by a lot of advertising, by having a lot of paid workers on the ground, by organizing large rallies which are also paid for and where people are often brought by paying money, etc. So therefore money plays a very important role in elections in our democracy. And that is why this law was brought limiting the uh, amount of expenses that any candidate could spend on an election. Earlier in Mrs. Gandhi's time, 35, it was 35,000, now it's about 40 lakhs or something like right. that. But unfortunately, all these rules are still broken. And recently, there have been some very retrograde changes uh, made in the law relating to funding of political parties. Last year, in the Finance Act, after the Delhi High Court had held the Congress and the BJP guilty of accepting foreign funds mm -hmm. in violation of the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act, they brought a retrospective amendment to the FCRA mm -hmm. saying that political parties could take donations from subsidiary. from subsidiaries of foreign companies, which essentially means from foreign corporations. This year, Two further retrograde amendments have been brought through the Finance Act. One, the limit on corporate funding of political parties, which was earlier 7.5% of their annual profits, has been removed. So now corporations can give any amount of donations to political parties, even foreign corporations. Mm -hmm. That is, subsidiaries of foreign corporations, because of the amendment last year. Yeah. And they can do so anonymously by this new device of electoral bonds that has been introduced. So uh, earlier there was this problem of lack of transparency in political funding because cash donations up to 20,000 did not need to be declared. So political parties were taking hundreds of crores mm -hmm. uh, by way of cash donations by just saying that these are all petty donations without disclosing who are the donors. Right. This time that 20,000 limit has been reduced to 2,000, but that makes no difference. People, political parties can still say that we received 90% of our funds in petty cash donations of under right. 2,000. So uh, unfortunately, most political parties get together, most major political parties come together for making these retrograde changes in election laws because it suits all the mainstream major political parties to increase the role of money power in elections because they know that they will have money, the other right. smaller parties or independents will not have money, to uh, also give other kinds of advantages to ruling parties or to 
major political parties and deny the same to other smaller parties and individuals. And that is what has happened. Right. And is, so do you think there's any way to actually try and challenge this kind of, these developments in, uh, in, in politics? Because we all look at it, we look at it, we get upset about it, but is there anything we can actually do? Like Raj Narayan, with your father's help, was able to, to try and take it to court at least. Is there something we can do about Yes, yes. In fact, we have prepared a petition. In fact, two petitions. Uh, one is regarding this leeway given to accepting cash right. by say without disclosing who are the donors. Yeah. And the other is this new changes that have been brought by way of removing the cap on corporate funding, by and making uh, donations anonymous, yeah. by allowing foreign funding, etc. All these are going to be challenged very shortly okay. by uh, Common Cause as well as Association yeah. for Democratic Reforms. Yeah. If you remember the first uh, direction for any kind of transparency in uh, the donations received by political parties also came as a result of a Common Cause petition and an order of the Supreme Court when they ordered mm -hmm. that political parties must file uh, income tax returns. Right. And therefore, so uh, the these, income, these tax. income tax returns are now disclosed to the Election Commission through whom organizations like ADR, Association for Democratic Reforms, are able to access them under right. RTI and thereby place them in the public domain. Unfortunately, despite an order of the Central Information Commission saying that political parties must come under RTI because they are uh, public authorities, political parties have not brought themselves under RTI so far. So, um, at the end, I mean, as to just sort of start wrapping up, I'm looking at the fact that obviously here, um, one of the legacies of the emergency was that the Supreme Court many feel didn't do, didn't play the role it should have at that time in trying to uh, protect democracy. Do you believe that the Supreme Court of today, if faced with similar challenges, would be able to take the right decisions and stand up to uh, a, a politician like Mrs. Gandhi who is trying to get away, get around it using things which, uh, try, use, using methods like she did? Well. <coughs> Uh, in Mrs. Gandhi's case, an emergency had been imposed when the case came up to the Supreme Court and retrospective changes in the election laws had been made. And it was because of that and the fear mm -hmm. uh, due to the emergency in the minds of judges, which was evident in the habeas corpus case, that ADM Jabalpur mm -hmm. case as well. But Justice Bhagwati of all people. Yes, he also yeah. mentioned that yeah. later. It was, I feel, because of that, that they allowed the retrospective changes in the election laws to remain in place without striking them down. And it was on those retrospective changes that Mrs. Gandhi's election was upheld by the Supreme Court. But having said that, you see, unseating a sitting prime minister or ordering criminal investigation against a sitting prime minister, especially against a powerful sitting prime minister, is always a tough call for a judge. It requires a judge who is independent as well as robust and bold. Unfortunately, most judges in the country would fail that test. And that is what we saw so Justice Sinha passed that test in the Allahabad High Court. But many other judges even at that time would have failed that test even prior to the emergency. Of course, the emergency brought a different dimension to the uh, situation at that time. But we have seen that same failure in the Birla Sahara Diaries case in the Supreme Court. It was a case, clearly a case, crying out for a criminal investigation yeah. where the income tax department had recovered documents from both the Birla and Sahara companies which showed bribery as well as payment of huge amounts of black money mm -hmm. to various politicians, particularly the Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, 40 crores in the case of Sahara, 25 crores in the case of Birla, 
but all that went uninvestigated despite the income tax department preparing detailed appraisal reports saying right. that these documents show the true state of affairs yeah and and you feel that that is something where the court should have taken a yes that's also a case of failure of justice on account of this getting overawed by the fact that uh, there is a prime minister on the other side who will have to be investigated and a powerful prime minister at that uh this has been incredibly it's been incredibly fascinating being able to have this discussion with you institution and i think um what we've looked at here in terms of what we've discussed is something which uh i think would be helpful for many other lawyers to also think about these kind of things and for people who are not practicing law as well to understand how uh, what are the main issues which we are facing in terms of political corruption and where we can uh, try and work uh, just to to work against it now for instance the path that you mentioned the ADR case the association for democratic reforms is filing a case and we hope that obviously there will be some progress in that matter and uh, we would we would look that works out uh, would you would it be okay for you to sign this copy of the book for us sure sure Should I address it to? Uh, to the quit would be great. Mm -hmm.